Let's bless his name together. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, 4, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem, Kivod Malchuto, Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. When Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. Ushartom la ot aya decha, vayula totafod bene necha, oktavtom amazozot betecha ovisharecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, v'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to have some songs of praise, and we're going to start off with Something very important. You know, people always talk about the return of the Lord. But what's most important is when he returns to our heart and we return to him. And so this is called the return. And when he returns, he comes and he restores. And that's what we want to see. God restore our nation, restore the communities, restore families, restore people to himself. Open the door, return and restore, oh Lord. Return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection, with full face attention, Shuva. Return and restore, cause it's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. And when we went astray, drifted so far away, you said the day and returned. Yes, you returned. You said return. So your life can be set free from all your captivity, and I will return to you, cause your exile now is through, and I'll rebuild you just like new. So Lord, return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection, with full face attention, Shuva. Return and restore, it's you we adore. Shuvah the Kuma, return and 
restore, it's you we live for. Oh Lord, return in your power, come back and shower us with love and affection. We give full face attention, Shuvavakuma, return and restore, it's you we adore. Shuvavakuma, return and restore, cause you're all we live for. Oh yes, return in your power. Back and shower us with love and affection. We make full face connection. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore, cause it's you we adore. Shuva the Kuma, return and restore. Open the door, return and restore. Open the door, return and restore us, O oh Lord. Praise the Lord. He wants to restore us. He wants to build us up. He wants to make us his own. And there is nothing more important than experiencing his presence. And, you know, in this week's portion, uh, Moses is up in the mountain and they're wondering why he's taking so long. We get to that later on. But the point is that they had just said to him, whatever God says, we will do. And when he says, when Yeshua says, follow me. We say yes, but then it seems like qualifiers come up sometimes and we need to be able to understand what it is he's purchased for us. We'll be talking about that a little bit today and understand what it means that he comes to make his home in us. Follow me. You'll know you follow me by the love you have for one another. You'll know you follow me by the way you care for each other. Follow me, follow me, just follow me, yes, follow me, greater love there's no man than that he laid out his life for his friend, but you don't want to be inconvenienced for 20 minutes. Or even just ten Think about it And follow me Don't be discouraged Just follow me And I know you follow me By the love you show to one another They'll know you follow me By the way you care for each other Follow me Friends and your family And love with the same love that I love Towards your neighbor and your enemy Think about it Then follow me Don't be afraid now Just follow me The 
Think about it and follow me. Just be encouraged and follow me. And I know you follow me by the love you show in every place you go. Just follow me, follow me, just follow me. Yes, just follow me. You know, it's funny. It's so simple what he says. Well, are you the Messiah? And can you give the doctrinal positions on all these different points? He, he just said, follow me. Follow me. His life demonstrated who he was. His life demonstrated for us how we need to be in following him and following his example, following him in whatever it is he calls us to do because he knows exactly what he's doing. And that's the reason why with him, we're always on the winning team. With him, we are always in position to be able to do exploits beyond our own resumes, beyond who we are, because he is so great. And there is none like him. There's none like our God. There's none like him anywhere. And so we sing this song, Ein Kelohenu, none like our God. And again, when it comes to the point where the worship, the round comes in, let that incense of praise rise up as we embrace the Lord and take hold of him in worship and let him minister to us his presence. You alone are our God. 
Cause you alone are our God You alone are our Lord You alone are our King You are our Savior in everything And to you we bring our incense of praise Worship Him Lift your hearts, lift your hands Blessed are you None like him anywhere. He is so amazing. And he bestows on us such amazing blessings, such amazing opportunities as we yield ourselves to him. There is no limit to what God can do. And he loves us so much. And what does he say simply? Follow me. Just follow me. And God will make a way for us like we've never imagined as we yield ourselves to him. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. We're so glad you're here. And our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey. That's because we live in Central Jersey. And that's where we declare. But it also is something that has a way of expanding beyond our borders to people everywhere. And our heart's desire is to declare Messiah, not just about him, but to declare in our lives and the way that we carry ourselves before him that they can recognize, like they said of the Talmudim, of the disciples of Yeshua, they took notice that they had been with Yeshua. Do people, when they meet us, recognize the imprint of the one who we say we follow? We need to be able to declare him in our words and in our actions and share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. That's so important because Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And when we share the truth of Yeshua, putting Messiah back into that original Jewish context and understand the words that he spoke and the way that he taught and the things that he did in the context of Torah, in the context of the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, we see the message so powerfully demonstrated, not just for Jewish people, but for all people. God said that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, we've seen that, for instance, with Israel, with all the technology and all that going on, that would be one way of blessing all the nations. But there's something much more powerful, and that is that through the seed of Abraham, Messiah came and opened the door for us to walk in union with God, to experience his presence, to experience his abiding presence, his living and making his dwelling within us. And so we share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes because that's the context in which God laid it out for the Jewish people and for all people to experience the wonder of his plan for humankind to be restored and reconciled back to himself and to one another. You know, that's why when we say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, he doesn't stop there. Yeshua always went to the heart of the issue. He said, and the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
we are called to love God with all of our heart. And that translates, if it doesn't translate into loving those people around us, we've somehow gone askew in understanding how we love God because it translates into how we treat one another. And we're grateful for all that God is doing and knitting us together as a people to reach the multitudes for Messiah and to see people set free and reconciled. We have our basket in the back uh, for Hamaser Vahaturuma. Now you may find this interesting. Teruma is offering. And today's Torah portion is called Teruma, offerings or contribution. And so we'll be uh, talking about that. We won't be talking about finances with the message, but the idea of contributing, of bringing ourselves as an offering before God. But we have back there the basket. You can place that in there. You have envelopes if you need it. You can also go on PayPal on our website at bethzion.org or mail it to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're grateful for all of the generosity and the love that people show and the prayers and the way, as I mention often, that God is knitting us together for an ultimate purpose of reaching the communities around us. It doesn't just happen in a vacuum. He chooses to take us like lively stones and put together like an architect would a structure that's not a building but people so that others can recognize the presence of God and experience Messiah and experience his life in us. And we're grateful for that. Avinu Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word and to look into the portions for this day and that you would bring application for our hearts and for our lives, that it wouldn't just be information that we put away for talking points, but that we would be transformed by your ruach, by your spirit, quickening your word to our hearts as we open our hearts to you and to your word. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Today's portion is called terumah, means contribution or offering. And it starts off in Shemot, Exodus, chapter 25, verse 1. And uh, it actually says this. It says, Daber el b'nei Yisrael, v'yechuli terumah. Hashem said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel to take up a collection for me. Accept the contribution from anyone who wholeheartedly wants to give. And it goes through this, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this portion because the context of this portion and next week's portion all talk about the vision that Moses saw on the mountain as God was revealing to Moses all of these different things and putting the tablets together for him to bring down to the people. And he's describing for them, it says in verse 8, they are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may live among them. And this is where they were going to in the ark. They were going to place the testimony, which I'm about to give you, he says. And it is really quite amazing. He mentions it twice. He said, inside the ark, you will put the testimony that I am about to give you. And it's this wonderful, not just the testimony of here are the tablets, but the testimony of God's provision for reaching and touching the Jewish people, for creating this people so that through our people, the Messiah would come to all people. And one of the things that we look at is, and probably to me the key verse in this section today is that verse 8 where it says, they are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. One of the things that is very clear when we look through the scripture, and we're calling this topic today, God's design for family living. In a way, God is calling us to come home. He's welcoming us home. And 
he says that they are to build a sanctuary for him. And this, in this case, was a, a tent of meeting. It was the tabernacle. And God was giving Moses all of the details about the tabernacle. In the meantime, the people were down below waiting for Moses to come back with the good news of what he was experiencing in the mountain. But from their perspective, they looked and they saw that Moses walked into a mountain filled with flames and fire and thunder and lightning and all of this going on. So it's no wonder 40 days later that they were wondering what's happened to him. They weren't sure. But it is interesting to note that before he went up there, he disclosed to them so many of the commands that are a part of Torah. And I mention that because a lot of times people think that the Torah all came after Moses descended with the tablets. But it wasn't that. He came with expanded explanation and understanding but a great bulk of what was presented was presented before Moses went into the mountain. And the people agreed, and they said, whatever God says, we will do. They agreed to all of that. And when you look at it, just agreeing to it is not enough. We're going to look at some passages in the Word Hadashah, the New Covenant, but before we do that, I want to mention just a couple of quick references to the Haftorah portion, because there we see something expanding beyond the tabernacle. We see in 1 Kings 6, we see God calling Shlomo, Solomon, David's son, to finish building this tabernacle, this house for the Lord, the temple. And so that it would no longer be a temporary shelter or a temporary place, but it would be a place that was substantially more impressive, I guess, in a way. But one thing that was very clear was that God's desire was not for a tabernacle or a building to be able to have his name on it, saying this is the temple of God. But he wanted to be among the people. He wanted to make his presence known. And when you look at it, the, con the connection between walking in obedience to God's word and God dwelling with us is carried over not only consistently through the Hebrew scriptures, but also throughout the new covenant. The connection is absolutely clear in its definition. It's there continually to obey God and to let him make his dwelling within us. And we'll be looking at a few of those passages. But I want you to look at 1 Kings 6, verse 12, because 12 and 13, it says this. Concerning this house which you are building, speaking to Solomon, if you will live according to my regulations, follow my rulings and observe all my mitzvot, all my commands, and live by them, then I will establish you with my promise that I made to David, your father. I will live in it among the people of Israel, and I will not abandon my people Israel. And it's such a powerful statement because he's telling him that you're building this house wonderful. He built the house for God. He finished it and all of this. He was putting all of these different elements together, the annex surrounding the house and all the elements that were with it. And just like we saw in the, we see in the Torah portion, all the little intricate minutia details of what was going to be a part of that tabernacle. And the reason we're not going into all the details of it now is because when Moses finally does come down with that, it goes through the details of it once again because all of those things have input into what it was that God was creating. And interestingly, he says, as we're going to look a little bit later, that that tabernacle was a shadow, a type and shadow 
of what Moses saw as the reality of the tabernacle of God in the heavenlies. And he said to build it precisely according to what I have shown you. That was something that comes up very clearly. But the connection here, it says this word of Hashem came to Shlomo, to Solomon. Concerning this house which you are building. And he gives him qualifications. He says, if you will live according to my regulations, follow my rulings, observe all my mitzvot. And I love this fact that there's a comma and then these words. To observe all my mitzvot and live by them. It isn't enough to be able to quote it, to know it, to discuss it, to divide up all the details of what it means. But is it being applicated in our lives? Is it applied to our lives in a way that manifests that we understand and comprehend what it is God called us to walk in obedience to do? And says, there's a promise with it. Then I will establish you with my promise that I made to David, your father. He will live among us. Everything comes down to the fact that God wants to make his home in us. There was a home wrecker back in the garden. He destroyed that aspect of the relationship Adam and Eve had with the father. But he promised that there would be one who would come that would bring restoration once again to that relationship. And so we see it unfolding. There is also an interesting passage I want to just mention quickly before we go to the New Covenant portions. And that is that in 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 5, this is where in chapter 6, David wanted to build a house for God. And in chapter, in verse 3 of chapter 7, uh, Nathan or Nathan the prophet said to the king go do everything that is in your heart for Hashem is with you the Lord is with you do what's in your heart but that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan go and tell my servant David that this is what Hashem says you are going to build me a house to live in since the day I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt until today, I never lived in a house. Rather, I traveled in a tent and a tabernacle. Everywhere I traveled with all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word to any of the tribes of Israel whom I ordered to shepherd my people Israel, asking, why haven't you built me a cedar wood house? <laughs> I think it's an interesting dialogue that God was having with Natan. And when he brought it to David, therefore, say this to my servant David, that this is what Hashem Sivaot, the Lord of hosts, says. I took you from the sheep yards, from following the sheep, to make you chief over the people, over Israel. I have been with you wherever you went. I have destroyed all your enemies ahead of you, and I am making your reputation great, like the reputations of the greatest people on earth. I will assign a place to my people Israel. I will plant them there so that they can live in their own place without being disturbed anymore. The wicked will no longer oppress them. And he goes on to say all this. And then he says this. Tell uh, that moreover Hashem tells you that he will make you a house. When your days come to an end and you sleep with your ancestors, I will establish one of your descendants to succeed you, one of your own flesh and blood, and I will set up his rulership. And this verse, verse 13, he will build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. If he does something wrong, I'll punish him with a rod and, a, and blows, just as everyone gets punished. Nevertheless, my grace will not leave him as I took it away from Shaul, King Saul, whom I removed from before you. And what is it that is so amazing? 
David's response was not, well, it's about time, but why can't I build it? I mean, I really want to do it. I've got really good design work in my head. David was humbled by the words that came to him from the Lord. And it says, then David went in, sat before Hashem and said, who am I? Hashem Elohim, God Almighty. And what is my family that has caused you to bring me this far? There was something so amazing and humbling about the way David, as the king, understood the words that God was saying. He understood that he was nobody, and God built the house around him. I like the picture in this just in this uh, image that we have for God's design for family living, you've got a family uh, in front of a couch and you've got a cardboard top that looks like the top of a house. They are one little household, one home. And there's a difference between a house and a home. You have a house you live in, but a home is what you build with your family and community and all of that. And God wants to be actively a part of our community and of our family. He is our father. And all of these things are so important. Uh, he says also, he said, who am I and what is my family that has caused you to bring me this far? What is my family? We have no pedigree of honor or any of special estate, but God saw in David something that he could wanted to bring forth. God sees in each one of us an element of eternity that is planted there by him for a purpose and a plan. All of us acknowledge at various times that sense of purpose, and we don't always know how it's going to manifest itself. But the way it manifests itself is not by ourself. It manifests itself as we yield ourselves and make room in us as a home for God to allow him to take residence within us so that we can experience God coming in and doing a, a home makeover, to do a design work in us. God's design for family living, God's design includes him in the midst of us as the key focal point of that relationship. Whether we're in the light or the dark, <laughs> he wants to be there for us in every way. And so we look down a little bit further, and I want you to look at John 14. And here we find, again, the connection between the commands of God, obeying God, and the dwelling among us of God, where he says in verse 15 of John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforting counselor like me the spirit of truth, to be with you forever. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees nor knows him. You know him because he is staying with you and will be united with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In just a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you too will live. When that day comes, you will know that I am united with my Father and you with me and I with you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. He then says a little bit further down in verse 23, Yeshua answered, If someone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Someone who doesn't love me doesn't keep my word, and the word you are hearing is not my own, but that of the Father who sent me. So it isn't just, he's saying it's not just my desire to live among you, but it is my Father's desire to come and make his home in us as well. And it is such a very powerful Thing He says also, I've told you these things, verse 25, while I am still with you, but the counselor, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything. That is, he will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
He will take of mine and reveal it to you. What I am leaving you is shalom, peace. I'm giving you shalom. I don't give it the way the world gives. There are no strings attached. Don't let yourself be upset or frightened. God wants to make his home in us. And he ties that element into walking in obedience to him, allowing him to have full reign in our homes and in our lives so that he can transform us in ways that we can't even comprehend. There's another passage in Luke 9 I want to look at. In Luke 9, in verse 57. Now, this is also interesting to consider because, like I said before, in the Torah portions, we see that God speaks to the people. And the people respond and say, whatever God says, we will do. He says, follow me, we'll follow you. Well, here in this section, Yeshua had that topic come up a lot. And in this section, there was one as he was traveling, as they were traveling on the road, verse 57 of Luke 9. A man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, it is easy to say, I will follow you, Lord, wherever you go. If you don't know where he's going and you don't know what it's going to cost you to do that. I'll follow you wherever you go. He sets up a little bit of the parameters for him to understand what he's going to have to go through. He says, wherever you go. Yeshua answered him, the foxes have holes and the birds flying about have nests. But the son of man has no home of his own. You're homeless? <laughs> to another, he said, follow me. But the man replied, sir, first let me go away and bury my father. The implication was that his father wasn't even dead yet. He was wanting to get all of his elements and things in order. And he said, Yeshua said, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, sir. But first, uh, let me say goodbye to the people at home. Now, it sounds pretty simple. He wants to, you know, it was like, he says, follow me. And he says, okay, just a minute. Let me just tell them I'm going with you. And, but that's not what is happening here. He's saying, I will follow you, sir. But first, let me say goodbye to the people at home. And the implication was that he needed to spend a little bit time with his family first. He needed to not cut off all of those elements. Yet he had connections that were important to him more important than right now following him. To him, Yeshua said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back is fit to serve in the kingdom of God. Now, I saw this in a little bit of a different light today. And that is that he says, no one puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back and keeps looking back is fit for the kingdom of of God. If you think about what was happening with the children of Israel as Moses was going up into the mountain, they were agreeing to do whatever he said. We will follow you everywhere, anywhere you go. And will you really <laughs> follow me? Well, let me do this first. Let me get my, my, my stuff in order. Let me make sure my inheritance is taken care of first, that I know I have uh, something of a nest egg to fall back on in case this journey with you doesn't work out quite the way I hope it will. There were issues that were there. And what's also interesting, he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow, when you think about people who are farming, they don't keep looking back to see, uh, they may want to check if the furrows are straight, if they're doing it in the proper way, but they don't keep looking back and saying, you know, maybe we could have developed this land a little bit differently. Maybe we could have put some condominiums up and some shopping centers. I don't know. Maybe this plowing stuff. It, he, it was not having a reluctance to look back to the past. And in a way, what you see with the children of Israel in Moses' time was that they were looking back and instead of plowing forward, moving forward, 
cutting in those furrows, planting those crops, doing the things that would be a part of that forward motion. They were looking back and said, you know, it, it was really comfortable in a way. We, we did have all of our food, our leeks and garlic and all of that. What do we have out here, this manna? When we look back, they, they looked back and in a way they kept looking back and saying, I don't know. We don't know what's become of this Moses. We'll see that in a couple weeks. We don't know what's become of this Moses. Make gods for us. <laughs> Make gods for us? You know, it's also interesting that he told Aaron and who was it, her? I forget. Her, right? And that was not the preferred pronoun. That was the person named her, H-U-R in English. But it was, um, you know, her has sent me. No, that's, that's not a pronoun thing. That is a person. And he said, if you have any issues, talk with them. <laughs> well, you know, later on, they did talk with them and said, make gods for us. And they said, oh, all right, give me your jewelry and we'll just. I mean, there was something missing in understanding what it was after seeing and being a part of seeing God move in such power. Could a person follow and see those things and not comprehend that God was still in control if they didn't hear from Moses for 40 days? They were looking back. They were interested in having fields eventually to plow, and yet they kept looking back. And he says, they're not fit to serve the kingdom of God. We need to be in a position where we don't just have an emotional moment where we say, Lord, come into my life. Yeshua, come into my life. Transform me and all of that. And then say, and, and the Lord says, follow me. And we say, okay, but first let me get a few things, a few bucks in the bank and a few things underway and a few things to have as backup just in case. Just in case what? I said, follow me. Just in case. You know, I, I want to follow you. But there is a mixture that's there. And we see that happening in this. And I think it's important, and, and we might look at, at Ephesians 6. Because there, he describes it in another way. He's telling them to follow and to walk with the Lord, to walk in union with the Lord. But what does it mean to walk in union with the Lord? It means that we are going and entering into a battlefield. We're entering into a place where it may not be just comfortable all the time. In fact, for the most part, it's not comfortable. It's like the, sort of like the story, you know, of the doctor who says to the patient, are you comfortable? And he comes back with, I make a living. <laughs> That's not the kind of comfortable he's talking about. In this case, chapter 6 of Ephesians starts off by saying, Children, what you should do in union with the Lord, interesting, he doesn't say walk in union with the Lord, although he says it in other places. He said, what you should do in union with the Lord is obey your parents. For this is right, honor your father and mother, he quotes from the Torah portion. This is the first command that embodies a promise so that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. There are provisions that are in place. There are boundaries that are set. There are perimeters that we don't cross. We need to be aware of where those boundaries are. As we mentioned last week, the law was not something to be strict over the people but as a marker for them to know when they were crossing a line, when they were getting close, when they were compromising with a way to wiggle around a law to do something. We mentioned last week when they questioned Yeshua having his disciples not eat with washing of their hands. And he used some examples. Uh, he also mentioned what you do is you make your provisions more important than God's. He said, you violate the passage that says, honor your father and mother by saying, I've committed it to God. I can't take care of them because it's all given to God. 
And it was a loophole that they put in place so they wouldn't take responsibility for the upkeep of their parents in their old age. These kinds of loopholes God wanted to bring down. And what's also interesting is that he says, children, what you should do in union with the Lord is obey your parents. It's the first command with promise. It also goes to the idea of God's design for family living, that when you break down the family, when you break down all of these things, you break down the credibility of God and the ability for God to bring, at least the adversary thinks so, to bring about the destruction of God and his purpose and plan. And when we cooperate with the adversary by being disrespectful to our parents or by not following through and doing the things that God's word says to do, even if we speak of being in union with God, it needs to be demonstrated by our actions what that truly means. It goes on to say, fathers, don't irritate your children and make them resentful. I don't think it's talking about dad humor. I think it's talking about abusive things, irritating your children, not giving them the understanding. He says, when your sons ask you, why do we do this? Say, God delivered us by a mighty hand, and we see the working of God, and they used it as ways of showing how God was intimately related to them. But he says, don't irritate your children. That doesn't mean... If you discipline them, you're irritating them. <laughs> it's, it's not. He's saying, don't antagonize them. Don't dismiss them. Don't say if they ask you a question, you have too many questions. Just do what I say. Take the time to interact with them. Take the time to explain and to show them what these things mean. Don't, fathers, don't irritate your children and make them resentful. Instead... Raise them with the Lord's kind of discipline and guidance. The Lord's kind of discipline and guidance will bring about a great experience in the family and also in the generations that follow. And then there is just a little bit further down, and this is going to be the last verse that we look at. In, chapter, in, in, in Ephesians 6, maybe the last verse, Ephesians 6 Verse 10, finally, grow powerful in union with the Lord. God wants us to be a household with him in the center of it. His design for family living is that he is the key part of the family. We have fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, all of this. Uh, Joanna, I love your family. You've got three generations in one house. A lot of families did that. There's connection between the grandchildren and the grandparents, between the fathers and the mothers and the children and the parents. It, it, there's something about maintaining those elements that are a part of the family structure that God sets up a design for family living because we're designed to live as families. Now, there may be changes in the families that happen, but there is something about the bond that is there when people are actively living to be there for one another. And he says, finally, grow powerful in union with the Lord. How do you grow powerful in union with the Lord? In union with his mighty strength, do you become a person who domineers everything? Now, he says, use all the armor and weaponry that God provides so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. There are challenges all around us to get us to fall back to the old nature, to not plow forward, but to look back and say, well, I don't know, maybe that wasn't so bad before. Why? Because we don't know what's happening next. Who knows what's happening next in life? That's part of life. And so he's saying, use all the armor and weaponry that God provides, not against one another, so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. For we are not 
struggling against human beings, but against rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers governing this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Take every piece of war equipment God provides so that when the evil day comes, you will be able to stand and resist. And when the battle is won, you will still be standing. It's to equip us not to fight against one another, but to take a stand against all those tactics that come against us from the adversary and to keep moving forward. And he gives a description of that there. We're not going to go into all of that now. But it is a very powerful word. And you know, when you see, think about the fact that Moses is in the mountain and during this time, God is showing him all the things that he wants to do for the people. All the things that it will be like when he is in the midst of them. When the tabernacle is up, his presence is there, his shekinah, his manifest presence is made known. Very, very powerful. What promises? Amazing things. In the meantime, they know nothing about what's going on, the conversation that's happening on the mountain between Moses, between Moshe and between God. And all of the wonder that Moses must be thinking like, oh, the people are going to love this. This is incredible. And they, when they find out what they agree to, I mean, in that case, it, wasn't the, it also was not the case where he said, believe it and then you'll know what's in it. He told them beforehand what's in it. And they agreed to it. Now he's coming back and he can't wait to tell them. And it's such a disappointment what happens later on, we'll see. But here he says this. Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who in the Messiah has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. In the Messiah, he chose us in love before the creation of the universe to be holy and without defect in his presence. And he goes on to talk, it says in verse 7, in union with him, through the shedding of his blood, he, we are set free. Our sins are forgiven. This accords with the wealth of the grace he has lavished on us in all his wisdom and insight. He has made known to us his secret plan, which by his own will he designed beforehand in connection with the Messiah and will put into effect when the time is ripe his plan to place everything in heaven and on earth under Messiah's leadership. Also in union with him, we were given an inheritance we who were picked in advance according to the purpose of the one who affects everything in keeping with the decision of his will. So that we who earlier had put our hope in the Messiah would bring him praise commensurate to his glory. He is speaking of these unspeakable, undeniable measures of blessing that was to be ours as believers. And I said it many times, we tend to live way below what it is God has built around us and built us for. And we need to be able to do that, to know that we are walking in union with him with what purpose? To establish the power of God to stand against the adversary and to walk in union with him so that we experience all of these amazing blessings that God makes available to us as a part of his gift, our inheritance from him. And he comes to live that inheritance in us. God's design for family living means that he is at the core of our family. It isn't just father and mother or grandparents and all that. It's God at the center as our father working in the household to make us walk in union with him and with one another and see the incredible things that God can do as we yield ourselves to him and not lean to our own understanding. Avino Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for all of these provisions and all of your blessings. We thank you, Father, for all that 
you have made available to us all of these great and precious promises that are beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. And we thank you that you bring us by the shed blood of Messiah the ability to be set free, our sins forgiven, what a great weight is lifted to experience the wealth of your grace lavished on us in all wisdom and insight so that we can know the secret plan, follow the pattern, follow the plan, follow the Lord, and God, you welcome us into your home that you make in us so that we can make opportunity for others to experience that blessing as well, to share with others the wonder of what it is you want to do in their life as you've done in ours and are doing. Even when we don't know exactly how it's going, we know that you've got it all under control and it's all working for our good because we love you and are called according to your purpose, not our own. We thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vehunecha Is Adonai Panavelecha Veyosem Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying Amen and Amen. Shabbat Shalom, greet one another. Join us for Onik Shabbat at the Beth Zion House after the service for our potluck Onik Shabbat for extended time of fellowship and opportunity to get together and we'll look forward to seeing you seeing you in shul shabbat shalom